right, well, let's turn in our course books to page 13. This is going to be song number six. Let's sing what we just heard playing. Christ died for me. When I was lost, all hope was gone. I couldn't find my way back home. My Lord heard me in my distress and showed me that he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond, and all because Christ died for me. The love he has can never be told, the price he paid to save my soul. May me my guilt and all my blame, and in hope and shame, Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me, and now I'm free from Satan's bond. And all because Christ died for me, the Savior on my Calvary's tree. There in the place that belonged to me, the realm in where in agony, when I died, when he died for me, Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me, and now I'm free. From Satan's bond, and all because Christ died for me. A million years will just begin, eternity will never end. Those nail scarred hands will remind me of the debt he paid when he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond. And all because Christ died for me. Yes, I was lost, but now I'm found. And by his grace, I'm heaven bound. My only hope, my only plea, is that Christ died, and he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond, and all because Christ died for me. Amen. All right, Brother Roberts coming to read for us. Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 124. <clears throat> if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, and their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Pray. Father God, we come before you now and we thank you for the word because your word is life in this tree. Lord, we know that we are helpless and hopeless sinners and our hope is only in Christ. 
Let us see Christ today as Brother Ken preaches the gospel. Open our hearts to receive it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we're going to sing this hymn to the tune of Oh God, our help in ages past. God's wisdom for the best design to ransom us and lost. And Christ's own blood and righteousness provided all the cause. Strict justice with a proving love, God's covenant was sealed. When God incarnate undertook to see the whole fulfilled, now sin appears deserving death and what its curse imposed. But Christ, our substitute and head, has lived and died and rose. Upon the merits of his blood, secure and safe by grace, we dare approach the throne of God in Christ who took our place. Amen. All right, Bob's coming to read for us that morning. Matthew 17, please. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeareth unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While they yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man is risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come, first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is already is come already, and they knew him not, but they have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the, the disciples understood that the, he spake unto them of John the Baptist. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, 
If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto the mountain, Remove thee, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorry. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus said unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that, and give it unto them for me and thee. May we pray. My gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word, again, proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please open our eyes to see Christ and Christ alone, our righteousness. We pray for those that are around the world, dear Lord, to hear this word. Give them strength, grace, and mercy, and protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Thankful for the reading of God's word. What a blessing. Well, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 144. Hark, 10,000 hearts and voices. We'll stand and sing this together before the message. Hymn number 144. Once again, now if you'll look in your Bibles to John chapter 7, I'm going to read the text from which I'll be 
preaching today, a word of prayer, and then make some comments. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou hast done. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. And when he said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, but not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews saw him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he's a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit, no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Gracious Father, as we take up this portion of scripture, I ask your blessing as we consider the Lord Jesus Christ is set forth here in your word and who he is in truth and how it is that he was hated of this world and yet loved of you. And uh, as your spirit is pleased to reveal him in hearts, those for whom he came to pay their sin debt, loved of that people. So I pray that as we contemplate your word that truly our own hearts would be opened that you would remove the scales from our eyes and the blindness that is there that we might behold the glory and beauty of your son in his coming into this world in his doing and working out that righteousness that you required and even in his being lifted up in his death in his burial and his resurrection ascension on high all of that to your glory and honor. And that that work continues as you call out a people for your name. And so I ask for your direction in the preaching of this word and the hearing. We give you the praise and honor and glory in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, I've entitled today's message, Unbelief and Opposition to Christ, but I could just as easily have entitled this much murmuring concerning him. That's exactly what we read here in verse 12 of this text, that there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. What do you suppose causes that murmuring? This certainly is not the popular Jesus that's being preached today. I don't hear people complaining about a Jesus that really would like to save you. And he came into this world and he laid down his life. But alas, now he's inviting you to please accept him. And if you do, then he can forgive you of your sins. Everything's conditioned upon man. And it's a Jesus that is being presented to people that is really in man's hands. Contrary to the Christ of Scripture, of whom it says there in John 17 that he thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh. 
to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. What do you suppose then was causing the murmuring and complaining here? Well, it's because this is a Jesus that as he presented himself to the people, he was not subject to them. And uh, he declared boldly that he didn't come to call the supposed righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, there's a word causes disturbance even today. I've found that in public settings where I've referred to people as sinners, ourselves as sinners, and you'll hear the murmuring going through the crowd. Did he say sinners? That's not a term that people want to hear today. They want to hear that, yes, they make mistakes once in a while, and yes, they fall once in a while, but God's a loving God, and he still loves them, and he wants them to be his children if they'll just listen, if they'll just hear. Well, that's not the Christ of Scripture. And so we're going to look at this in this portion and see how this particular unbelief and opposition to Christ is not unique just to one certain category of people because through this portion that we've just read, we do see number one in verses one and two, that unbelief and opposition from the Jewish leaders. When it says here in verse one, he would not walk in Jewry. Now Christ himself was a Jew. He was born into a Jewish family. So it's not that he's renouncing his earthly heritage because God purposed it, that he should come from that line of Abraham and be born of the seed of David. In fact, when he talked to the Samaritan woman, he declared that salvation came from the Jews. He wasn't saying he had to become a Jew in order to be saved, but what he was saying is that promise of salvation, the promised one who is the savior would come from this particular line. So it's not being a Jew here that he's denouncing, but he's declaring, and the word is, John writing this inspired word, that the opposition was with the Jewish leaders. These were the ones that had the law, they had the scriptures, and weekly in the temple and in the synagogues, they opened these scriptures and read them, but they were not pointing sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ. That opposition began with them, much as it is today. I find there are a lot of people as I talk to them just face to face and take this word. You see them reading the scriptures and having their supposed devotions. And if you ever sit down next to them and ask them sometime, well, what are you reading and what are you getting out of what you're reading? You can see that there are some people that have a desire to know, God's given it to them, what this word means. And yet, as you point them to a sovereign Lord Jesus Christ, one in whose hands God has given all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father has given him. And you point out to them from the scriptures, even as we're reading here, that it's not for everybody. That God has purposed to save those that he has chosen. And when you open up the scriptures and show them that the death of Christ wasn't just some general sacrifice, to lay down his life for anybody and everybody, and now it's up to each one to get out of it whatever they can. That's not the Christ of Scripture. I've found in opening up that to individuals that all of a sudden it's like a light comes on and they're seeing scriptures that have never been opened up to them before. Ephesians chapter 1, that entire chapter, talks about the spiritual blessings that are ours in spiritual places in Christ Jesus. And it begins with election and predestination and goes right on down through redemption and who it is that Christ has redeemed. This is not a general message it's that the world is hearing, but it's there in the word. And as you point people to the word, they're looking at it and 
I've had some say, well, I've never heard this preached before. Well, there's a reason. Again, it's the jewelry. It's the leaders that don't want their people to read those portions of scripture because it goes against what they're preaching. They're preaching a general love of God for everybody. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. They're preaching that Jesus has laid his, down his life for everybody. And now it's up to them to believe it or not. That, that's their message. And it's popular. Why? Because it puts the power in man's hands. That's why people like to come. They like to have a preacher tell them it's up to you. Boy, they can get busy doing that. But to declare, as the scriptures do, that it's not up to you. It's not even up to me. As much as I believe this message, I can in no way take and put it in anybody's heart and mind and cause them to believe. It's not up to me. It's God who works as he will. Even as Christ said to Nicodemus, the spirit's like the wind that blows where it listens. And you, you can't tell from whence it comes to where it goes. Such is those that are born of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's work to do. But it's the preachers. And this is what I've found is you talk to different individuals. You might see them the next week or get back and say, well, hey, how, how are you doing in your scripture reading? And they said, you know, I went back and talked to my preacher about what you said. And boy, they told me you were a Calvinist and that that's heresy and that you don't need to be listening to that man. Where does all that come from? Who mentioned Calvin? I don't find Calvin's name anywhere in scripture. Now this is a gospel that glorifies none other than the Lord Jesus Christ and gives him all the glory without any contribution on man's part. Anything that we have to say or do comes from the spirit of God himself, giving us that spirit to worship him. So there's the first unbelief and opposition that we see here in these first two verses was among the Jewish leaders. And it was during the time here of the, it's called here in verse two, the Jews feast of tabernacles. This was a feast, if you look back in Leviticus chapter 23, and boy, do people love feast days. That's the time when things get going and blowing. People are stirring about it, and everybody's going about trying to make the best they can of their feast days. Well, here in Leviticus chapter 23, some would look at it and say, well, it was in the law, in God purpose that the Jews should celebrate this particular feast day as a feast under the Lord. And what was it for? What did it represent? Here it says in Leviticus 23 and verse 40, and ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees. So this was not to be just some old dead branches, but go out there and cut some live branches from some trees, branches of palm trees and the boughs of thick trees why that? Well, to build a shelter. And willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. This was a particular feast that was to go on for seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days of the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And ye shall dwell in booths seven days. The closest thing I can think of for us to understand would be like setting up a tent in your front yard and going in and sitting down and for seven days sleeping in there, eating in there, and gathering in there. Today, people like to go camping, and that's what they do out in other places, but this was to be in your place of dwelling. And that all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. And here's the reason, verse 43, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This was a reminder to them of God's mercies toward them and bringing them out of Egypt. And all those years that they were in the wilderness dwelling in those tents, 
Even when they got into the land, they were to continue to remember God's mercies and how he kept them and that he is the Lord their God. Now, I see pictures of Christ here in this booth because Christ is that goodly tree. He is the branch of David made of those palm trees and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook. He's the living Savior. He's the tree of life in which his people dwell and rejoice all their days, knowing that it's because of who he is that we live. So this was what the Feast of Tabernacles was all about. But I find it interesting here in coming back to our text in John chapter 7, verse 2, that our Lord in this context calls it the Jews' feast. He didn't call it my feast. Well, it was like anything that they had done. They had perverted it. They had made it into something other than what its purpose and intent was, just like the temple. That Feast of Tabernacles had everything to do with Christ, the tree of life. And here he was now in their midst, and yet they didn't see him, nor did they glorify him. They went about their feast day, making it to be something of their own tradition, but nothing to do with Christ. And that's why Christ removed himself. When it says there, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, there in verse one, that was in the northern part of the land. All of this was taking place down in Jerusalem, which was in Judah. And so the brethren, knowing it to be that Feast of Tabernacles, they're saying to him, well, aren't you gonna go down there and use that as an opportunity to make yourself known? Go ahead and make your big entrance. So that leads us to the second point here of opposition. It wasn't just unbelief and opposition from the Jewish leaders. And so strong was their opposition, even at this point in Christ's ministry, there in verse one, it says, because the Jews sought to kill him. There it is again, the leaders were looking for a way to be rid of this one. Why? Because he stood against all of their traditions and their ceremonies and what they had made of the law without ever seeing Christ. But the second point here in verses three to five is that there was unbelief and opposition even with Christ's family. And we're talking here about his family. We're talking about his earthly family. And it says there, his brethren, therefore said unto him in verse three. Some are surprised to read here in the Bible that the Lord Jesus had brothers because they here again, Jewry. People have taught him that no, when he was born of that virgin, that Mary did not have any other children and they make an idol out of Mary. They, they say, well, for Christ to be pure, she had to be pure. So there were no other children that were born from her. Well, that goes against what we see plainly taught here in scripture. What made Christ to be that holy seed and that he was without sin was that the spirit of God conceived him in the womb. That conception was of the spirit of God and it was the womb of a virgin. That's why he's called the seed of a woman. That's a mystery in of itself because that word seed means semen. So you look at it scientifically and you say, well, there's a problem because the woman doesn't have a seed. Well, that's the purpose that when Christ came, he would not be of the seed of Adam. If he had been of the seed of Adam, if somehow Joseph had planted that seed, that he would have been a sinful creature just like the rest. There's a purpose in all of this that God ordained that his son come in this world and be that perfect seed, that perfect savior. But after that God had fulfilled his purpose, it's pretty clear in scripture that Mary had other children. John had already mentioned the brothers of Jesus back here in John chapter 2 and verse 12 that we studied some time ago. It says there, after this, he went down to Capernaum. He, and that's 
the miracle in Cana when he turned the water into wine, and his mother and what? His brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. So it's pretty clear that he had these other siblings, if you will, that came from the womb of Mary as a result of her relationship with Joseph. But Christ, as in anything, was set apart. In Matthew chapter 12, in verses 46 and 47, I know there's some that try to change the word again, and it's because they have teaching that is contrary to what the scriptures say. If we just stick with the plain teaching of scripture, it's not complicated. But some will say, well, this word brethren here actually means cousins, so it refers to other siblings, other cousins. Well, that's not what the word says. It says brothers. In Matthew chapter 12, in verses 46 and 47, here was our Lord teaching, and while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Now, this is an interesting portion because this goes right along with what we're seeing here in John chapter 7, how people trying to direct the Lord, thinking they know best, like so many do today. They think they know best, and so in their prayers, it's really not prayers. The word prayer means supplication, to bow to his will. What they're trying to do is direct him by their prayers. If we can just get enough people together to join in this prayer, we can get God doing what we need him to do. Well, that's idolatry. That's not how God works. Here, while he was speaking, his mother and his brethren stood without. The press was so great that they couldn't even get to him. Desired to speak to him. And then one said unto him, unto Christ, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Now, he wasn't being disrespectful. We know that being perfect in the flesh, he would have shown all the way from his childhood up, shown respect to his mother and even to his adopted father and to these brothers and even a sister we're going to see. There was a physical sister involved here. But when he says here in verse 48, he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? Here again, we see a clear distinction of how our Lord looked upon fellow creatures. It wasn't everybody that he came to save. His eye, just like from eternity, would have been on those and is always on those that the Father gave him. That's his family. He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. <laughs> I, love, I love this. Indicating each one. And saying, behold, my mother and my brother. I don't know what that speaks to you, but for me, I just bow and I wonder how it is that I could even be considered one of these. No different than any others. And yet that the Lord would stretch out his hand and identify such sinners as we are. And he said, whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. A lot of people like to jump on that. I see there's the doing. You got to do something. No, that's not what it's saying. Anybody that does the will of my father, which is in heaven. Well, what is the will of his father, which is in heaven? We already have seen that in John chapter six. If you go back there in verse 38, he says, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. In verse 39, this is the Father's will which has sent me. That word will doesn't mean wish. Well, here's, here's what God wishes. No, this is his will. That word is a strong word, his decree. This is what he has decreed that of all, which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. 
but should raise it up again the last day. So there are those that God has decreed in his will and given to his son for whom he came into this world. And that's why he wasn't even affected here by these brethren and their dictates attempting to direct his work and what he was doing. It says here in verse 40 of John 6, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, that's the first thing. Who is the person, as he describes here, that does the will of the Father? Well, they see the Son. In other words, they're given eyes to see. He opens their eyes. But notice the following, and believeth in him. Those two always go together. If God has ever opened a sinner's eyes to see the Son for who he is in all his glory, they will believe on him. The faith to believe is the result of him opening the eyes to see that they may have everlasting life. And he says, I'll raise him up the last day. So even here in the beginning, and there's one other scripture there in Matthew chapter 13. So this isn't just one portion of scripture that speaks of his physical brethren, but here in Matthew chapter 14, or 13, in verses 55 and 56, it speaks of his sisters. Matthew 13 and verse 55. When they said of Christ, as he taught these parables, it says in verse 54, when he was come into his own country, that's back up there in Galilee, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not the, his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and what? His sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? So there was in the beginning here, these that were physical brethren from the same mother. And yet, what do we read in John chapter seven? It says there that they believe not on him. See that in verse 5? Some might look at that and say, well, he should have been happy that they wanted him to go up to Jerusalem and to reveal himself. But the Lord knew that their purpose and intent wasn't why he came to this earth. It says there in verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Now, there came a time we know that they did because we find them after Christ raised from the grave and ascended on high there in Acts chapter 1 meeting with the rest of the disciples in the upper room, Mary herself included. But at this point, they did not yet believe on him. They were trying to take advantage of that relationship that they had with him coming from the same mother, if you will. And yet it wasn't for his glory that they were encouraging him to go down there to Jerusalem and use that platform. See, that's what they were thinking. When they said in verse three unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Go down there and do something big, Jesus. <laughs> Talking to him as if he was their equal. But that's not why Christ came. The reason he came was to save a people. And it would be according to God's working. And in God's time, according to his purpose. Now there's some when they read this, because it says there in verse eight, go ye up unto this feast. I go not up, there it is, yet. That's important unto this feast. He didn't say, well, I'm gonna go up there. So when you read there in verse, the following verse in verse 10, when his brethren were gone up, he let them go on and do whatever they were going to do at that point. Then went he also up unto the feast. 
But he didn't say he wasn't going to go up, but he said, yeah, I'm not going to go up in your time, and I will not go up to do what you want me to do. Not openly, but as it were in secret. In other words, he went, but he was not going to publicly reveal himself at this time. So that's what we find here, that at this particular point, even their suggesting or trying to direct the Lord Jesus Christ was a sign of unbelief. It was just as much as the unbelief amongst the Jews. And we find, as I said, at this particular time, that these brothers apparently for some time did not support the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ until after his death and resurrection. If you look in Mark chapter 3, and this is what I want to show you, that we lose not hope. Because you stop and think about a time where you believed, as you read in this word concerning the Lord Jesus, that it was up to you, perhaps, to direct him and to do those things in order to get him to act. But then, if you're the Lord's, when it pleased God to reveal Christ in you, turned it all around. That's where he brought you to bow. But here in Mark chapter 3 and verse 21, it is clear, it says, And the multitude cometh together again in verse 20, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is beside himself. Now, when it says that his friends heard of it, that would have included even these brother at the time. As we see here in verse 5, they did not believe him. They thought he was out of his mind. So at what point can we say that they believe? We don't know. We know it was in the Lord's time. We know that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, as I mentioned earlier, I want you to see it there. We find them here in the upper room with the church. The 121 that were gathered there after Christ had ascended, it said in verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and what? With his brethren. We just know this, even though there may be opposition and uh, unbelief in the heart. That's how we're all born in this world. I know this, though, that everyone for whom Christ paid the debt, he's going to have. So that's why we don't despair when we see unbelief even amongst our own family members. Could it be our children, could it be a spouse or anyone else that the Lord has not yet been pleased to reveal. They're busy about the world's traditions. They're out there celebrating all these religious feasts, just like the Feast of the Tabernacle. And they're all caught up in it, and they wonder why you don't join with them. Well, there's a reason. Christ has separated us out. It's not about feasts and traditions and times and seasons. It's about Christ. We worship him by his grace and mercy every time that we gather. He's the object of our worship. His coming, his doing, his dying, his rising again, his sitting on high. We don't need a special day, but every day, every time the Lord brings us together. But why is it that way? In simplicity, it's because it's pleased God to reveal Christ in us. But Coming back to my text here in John chapter 7, let's look at one more opposition that is here in this text, and that's the unbelief and opposition of the world. Here in verses 6 through 9, he said to his brethren, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. I think there's a lot of people today, that's how they think of 
Jesus, we need to be out there busy doing and talking and telling and turning arms and trying to get people to make their decision. Your time is always ready. You're thinking that it's up to you to do the Lord's work. Well, guess what? It's not. The Lord is always going to do his work in his way, and he doesn't need our help. That's what he's telling them. Your time is always ready, but my time has not yet come. There's a lot of significance in what the Lord was telling them, but here's the opposition from the world. We spoke of jewelry. We spoke of even those of his own family, but he says here, verse seven, the world cannot hate you. Why? Because they had a perception of Jesus or they were attempting to to present the Lord Jesus in a way that the world could accept. In fact, in John chapter five, if you, if you look back there, we, we saw that not too long ago in verses 16 down to verse 23, that they sought to make him to be a king. It says there in, uh, well, verse 15, it begins there. You can read that whole portion. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. That was their perception. Well, who would be against that? Here we want to make him king. That's the message of today. Jesus has come and now he's just waiting for you to make him your Lord and Savior. Their time was always ready, but that's not why Christ came. He didn't come to be loved and liked and appreciated by the world. And let's beware then of preaching a message that makes in any way Christ to be palatable to this world. He said, the world cannot hate you. We have a popular Christianity so-called today that the world loves and the people are drawn in by it. But it's not the Christ of Scripture. He says here, me it hateth. Ask yourself, what's the difference between the Jesus that the world loves and the one that the world hates? Well, I'll tell you this, it's the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't cater to men, nor is he influenced or affected in any way by man's will. There's nothing in man that's good. In fact, he says that in verse seven, if you're wondering what was it that they hated about him? It says that the works thereof are evil. That's the message of scripture. And if you begin with that, the effects of the fall, and that in this book, this inspired word of God, there is nothing good to say about man. I'll guarantee you that's the number one reason why the building's not full and that people aren't rushing to come and hear this message. They don't like to hear that. They wanna hear that somehow there's some good, something I have to offer. It's like Cain, that's Cain's religion. Best fruit of his hands that he came and presented, yet the Lord would not consider. Told him, he said, go do that which is right. Well, what was right? Go get that sacrifice. But I'll tell you those that do want to hear of an exalted Christ and an effectual Savior whose blood has put away their sin forever and God has justified them for one reason, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's those that he's taught by his spirit, those that the Father has given him. That's the reason here when it says, I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. There's nothing that can ever cause Christ to look upon a sinner and have mercy upon that sinner other than Christ having purposed it. And that's what John wrote about over there in John chapter three, if you look there. People love to quote John three sixteen. 
But this is not a portion of scripture that I avoid. Some say, well, you can't preach John 3.16. Well, I'm about to. Here it says here in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And I've explained before that word, so is the word in this manner. If you want to know how he loved the world, go up there to verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you see that? Even so, that's that same word. Even so must, even in this manner, must the Son of Man be lifted up. So when you read in verse 16, it's not saying God so loved the world. His arms are outstretched and he's just waiting for you now to run into his embrace. It's not what it's saying. It's saying for, for God in this manner loved the world. Well, you got to read on. How did he love the world? Was it everybody in the world? Well, it says that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him doesn't say that anybody and everybody doesn't say those that don't believe in him, he loved them at no. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but hath everlasting life. Well, who believes in him? None would believe except for those that he draws. That's clear in John 6 that we've already read. None can come to him except that be given them of the Father. In reality, those that think they know and understand John 3, 16, haven't even got a clue. But here's the connection with what we're seeing in John 7, because it says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. When he came, he didn't have to come and condemn it. It was condemned already in Adam. He didn't have to do anything to condemn the world. But that the world, and there is again in that context, those that would believe on him in the world, the world of Jew and Gentile. But don't jump over those two words. Through him might believe and be saved. That's the only way any are going to believe. That's the only way and will be saved. It's through him. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Why? Because their faith in him is the proof that Christ paid their debt. There's therefore now no condemnation, but he that believeth not is what? Condemned already. In Adam. There's nothing that needs to be added to it except for God just to simply pass by that sinner. Leave him to his condemnation because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But look at here. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world. But if God ever leaves a sinner to their darkness, it says here, men loved darkness rather than light because what their deeds were evil. And that's exactly what the Lord is saying over here in John chapter seven. The world loves a so-called Jesus that caters to, to them but it hateth me. It hates a Christ that saves whom he will. Well, we know that the Lord did go up to Jerusalem. And even as he, the word got around that he was there, you can see it says they murmured among the people concerning him. That, that's what people do. They try to figure out this, this Christ. Some say he's a good man. Some say he's a deceiver. And that would be our case. We would not know for sure unless it had pleased him to come and by his spirit, reveal himself in our hearts. I pray the Lord would grant us a heart of faith, a heart of belief to know this Christ and to believe on him. That's a sure evidence of his grace. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 145. We'll stand and sing this. Hail thou once despised Jesus. He's no longer in this world where men can get their hands on him. He, he was delivered up into wicked hands by God's purpose and accomplished salvation by his death. And now he ever lives and reigns on high. Hymn number 145. Hail the 